Hello and welcome. You're watching We On Fine Print. I am Krishna Kumar. India has trashed Pakistan's foreign minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi's remarks, blaming India for blocking peace efforts. India's foreign ministry sources have termed the Pakistan's allegations as baseless. The sources have told We On that the remarks by the Pakistani foreign minister about Ms. Swaraj leaving the foreign minister's meeting were surprising and unfortunate. It should be noted that she was neither the first one nor the only one who left the meeting. After being snubbed by India, Pakistan's foreign minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi had accused India of hampering the spirit of the Sark group of nations. मैं ये कह सकता हूं कि वो बीच दौरान उठ गई मीटिंग के हो सकता है तबीयत नासाज हो लेकिन ये बड़ा वाजे है कि उनकी मैंने गुफ्तगु बड़े गौर से सुनी और उन्होंने रीजनल कोऑपरेशन की बात की मेरा सवाल ये है कि रीजनल कोऑपरेशन मुमकिन कैसे होगी जब रीजन वाले मिल बैठने के लिए तैयार हैं और आप उस बैठक में रुकावट है तो मुझे समझाइए इस खित्ते की और इस रीजनल कोऑपरेशन की पेशरफ कैसी मुमकिन है इंडियन फॉरेन मिनिस्टर सुषमा स्वराज आल्सो मेड अ स्ट्रांग स्टेटमेंट ऑन टेररिज्म थ्रेटनिंग पीस एंड स्टेबिलिटी इन साउथ एशिया एडिंग दैट रीजनल कोऑपरेशन द शाह महमूद कुरैशी वाज टॉकिंग अबाउट इन साउथ एशिया इज नॉट पॉसिबल विदाउट एन एनवायरमेंट ऑफ पीस एंड सिक्योरिटी So now India and Pakistan from have gone from talks to no talks again and a very strong snub and rebuttal by India to Pakistan's claims that it was India which was subverting the cause of peace Later at a BRICS ministerial meet Sushma Swaraj said that BRICS leaders have given New Delhi a robust mandate on counter terrorism at successive summits It's the top focus here on We on Fine Print, and now we're joined by former Indian High Commissioner G. Pat Sardi here. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pat Sardi, for taking time out to be with us uh, here on We on Fine Print. I have to ask you this: uh, You know, Shah Mahmood Qureshi is known to say a lot of things, mm. from what what I understand. Mm. But in this particular case, Shah Mahmood Qureshi. was saying things that were not under the purview of the sark meeting in the first place no let's be very clear uh, shah mahmood qureshi is too mercurial a person to be a mercurial a person to be a foreign minister this is not the first time when he has uh, transgressed normal courtesies now according to the sark charter mm. they were seated in a mini- meeting of sark foreign ministers mm. according to the sark charter mm. sark is not meant to raise or discuss bilateral issues the charter specifically excludes excludes bilateral issues or any differences we may have with pakistan or bangladesh or bhutan may have with nepal these cannot be discussed in sark that is the basis on which sark was formed now if shah mahmood qureshi chooses to hurl accusations on india on issues pertaining to india pakistan relations he is violating the basic charter of sark so what has going to be its implications one sushma swaraj walked out yeah but i think our friends both in india and abroad must learn one thing mm. sark has not been able to progress because pakistan has not implemented the provisions of major agreements sark is a free trade area pakistan denies free trade to india it is the only country everybody else is having free trade pak says uh, pakistan says they won't have it for and india and india has been distancing itself from sark and rather resorting to other that forums is, like that the bills that is the reason because uh whenever we are in a sark meeting pakistan especially when it is represented by people like foreign minister qureshi mm. choose to raise bilateral issues which is outside the purview and worse still they don't implement agreements within sark 
So what has India done? We are not ending regional cooperation in South Asia. What we have done is shifted our collab, uh, f f uh, economic agreement regionally, regionally to BIMSTEC, which is our eastern neighborhood, including Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, uh, yes. Thailand. Yes, the Bay of Bengal, uh, and and yeah, yeah. So and economic every, every country on our shores, Nepal, Bhutan, which are landlocked, on our eastern shores is already in regionally Fair. with us in another in another another format Fair. and worse still for pakistan's point of view there are two members of asean in this format i understand so yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Batsadi, uh, please stay with us, sir, uh, mm -hmm. because we're now being joined by my colleague uh, Siddhant Sibyl, who has been getting us all the updates uh, from the United Nations uh, General Assembly in New York. And he joins us live from New York right now. Uh, Siddhant, uh, Shah Mahmood Qureshi's statements, and we have with us uh, uh, Mr. G. Batsadi, former Indian High Commissioner, and he's made it very clear. He should not have made any statements about bilateral talks at a SARC summit that wasn't meant for it in the first place. Well, what happened in SARC was primarily because of Pakistan. Pakistan was uh, isolated completely during the SARC meeting which took place here in New York. Uh, none of the other ministers spoke after the meeting got uh, over and it was a Pakistani foreign minister who came out and started lashing against India and the foreign minister of India. But let me tell you, it was not only India that left the meeting, it was Afghanistan also. Afghan foreign minister left I earlier than India after delivering the statement and then later on the Indian minister after uh, g giving the statement left uh, the meeting and uh, India was being represented by the foreign secretary throughout the meeting but they were personal remarks which were made by the foreign minister of Pakistan and Pakistan seemed frustrated after the meeting because Pakistan had planned to use that platform to not only amplify its anti-India rants but also try to make sure that the summit happens uh, in Islamabad which nobody agreed to. Siddharth Aunt, yeah. how, I wanted to ask you, how surprised was the media contingent when uh, you know, Shah Mahmood uh, Qureshi came out uh, you know, uh, in, uh, lashing uh, out against uh, India? I mean, it, it was unexpected, I'm sure, even for uh, the entire media contingent, which included you as well. Well, uh, the expected part was that we did expect it, Pakistani foreign minister to speak because it works for him speaking against India for his domestic constituency. What was surprising for us was the fact the way he spoke against India, made personal remarks against the Indian foreign minister and uh, went against the norm of diplomacy at the United Nations saying that the minister left in between the meeting and forgot to mention that there were other ministers who, who left the meeting. His body language was pretty stiff. He didn't even bother to look at the Indian minister when she entered. There were no pleasantries exchanged and he was visibly very angry uh, when the meeting got over. Angry because none of the ministers were eager to hear him, uh, hear, the, hear the Pakistani foreign minister and Pakistan was right. isolated at that right. meeting and uh, Pakistani delegation was the largest to, to come and represent at the SARC meeting. Sadan Sibal joining us live from uh, New York. Uh, I'm just going to bounce those uh, details, those juicy details that uh, uh, Sadan has picked up uh, from the United Nations General Assembly, the SARC summit and the sidelines of it. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Parthasardi, I want you to weigh in of these details uh, that we do have. It's quite simple. You know, Pakistan was supposed to chair and host SARC. Huh. But there were countries which just did not want to go to Pakistan. It was not just India. People who led the decision not to go were Afghanistan, Bangladesh. They were joined by India and Bhutan. Mm. So five of the members refused to go to Pakistan, not just India. It started with Afghanistan because they said Pakistan was promoting terrorism. Mm. And the, the uh, uh, Afghan president uh, refused to go to, for the SAC summit. Afghanistan asked us to follow suit. That, that was the time they were, terrorism was at its worst and they had done nothing about the, with, though the SAR, there's a SAR charter on terrorism. Ba Bangladesh was facing the same problem mm. of radical Islamic elements receiving support in Pakistan. So Bangladesh dropped out and Bhutan said, if all these people are dropping in, we see no point. One last question. So they've, they've knocked out any possibility 
in the immediate future of sark meeting yeah. under their chairmanship yeah because of this because okay, of this, this and it's not just it's not just india it's afghanistan yes. bangladesh and bhutan with india and the stunt that shah mahmood qureshi pulled off mm. on the side of the sark summit one last quick thought uh, from you do you think it was you know at the end of the day anger spilling out from the fact that india was the one to cancel the proposed foreign ministry level talks between india and pakistan two things uh, one it's not nothing new as far as shah mahmood qureshi is concerned second he is a very ambitious man who believes that he had is destined for higher responsibilities so uh, he has to the pakistan army Mm. to appear more radical than his prime minister wow <laughs> the historic judgment women of all ages will now be allowed in kerala's renowned sabarimala temple and the supreme court of india has said in a majority decision led by the chief justice of india deepak mishra with one dissenting voice and that came surprisingly from the woman judge on the bench indu malhotra doing away with the centuries old tradition where women of menstrual age were restricted from entering the temple as its presiding deity lord ayappa is considered to be a celibate chief justice of india deepak mishra said devotion cannot be subjected to discrimination and a patriarchal notion cannot be allowed to trump equality in devotion the head priest of shabarimala temple today said we are disappointed but accept the supreme court verdict on women entry 12 years after the case came to court the indian apex court has allowed menstruating women to enter the sabrimala temple in the southern indian state of kerala the apex court said that this ban was a form of untouchability and that men and women have equal rights guaranteed to them under the constitution of india however justice indu malhotra the only woman judge in the five judge constitution bench disagreed with other judges and said that essential practices of a religion need to be decided by the religion only one must not interfere with religious faith jessica taneja with the journalist ajit for vion new delhi it's a good judgment because it opens up and and brings the way forward for hinduism to become even more all inclusive and not the property of one uh, type one caste one sex illa adu nokatte nokitte njangal endha nilavaadu seerikkindathu idu kondu avasanipikkalanu ennalladhine petti ദേവസ്വം ബോർഡ് തന്നെ ചർച്ച ചെയ്യേണ്ടതായിട്ടുണ്ട് മൂന്നാം തീയതിയിലെ ബോർഡ് ആ പ്രശ്നം ചർച്ച ചെയ്തിട്ട് ആവശ്യമായിട്ടുള്ള നിലപാട് സ്വീകരിക്കും ലെറ്റ്സ് നോ ടേക്ക് എ ക്ലോസ് ലുക്ക് ആറ്റ് ദി ടോപ് കോർട്സ് വെർഡിക്റ്റ് ഇൻ ഡീറ്റെയിൽ ആൻഡ് ആർഗ്യുമെന്റ്സ് റേസ്ഡ് ബൈ ദി ഫോർ കൺകറിംഗ് ജഡ്ജസ് ദി സുപ്രീം കോർട്ട് സെഡ് വുമൻ ആർ ഈക്വലി എൻടൈറ്റൽഡ് ഫോർ റിലിജിയസ് പ്രാക്ടീസ് ഡിവോഷൻ കാൻ നോട്ട് ബി സബ്ജക്റ്റഡ് ടു ജെൻഡർ ഡിസ്ക്രിമിനേഷൻ വുമൻ ആർ നോട്ട് ലെസ്സർ ഓർ ഇൻഫീരിയർ ടു മെൻ ബയോളജിക്കൽ റീസൺസ് കാൻ നോട്ട് ബി അക്സെപ്റ്റഡ് ഇൻ ഫ്രീഡം ഫോർ ഫേത്ത് practice in the shabarimala temple violates the rights of hindu women to treat women as children of a lesser god is to blink at the constitution itself the physiological feature of menstruating has nothing to do with the right to pray dignity of an individual is an unwavering nature of fundamental rights fundamental rights are essential for transformation of a society the devotees of ayappa don't constitute a separate religious denomination now the judgment was a 4 to 1 verdict and to everyone's surprise the one dissenting judge was a woman justice indu malhotra was the only judge of the five judge bench who was against lifting of the ban on women's entry into the shabarimala temple justice indu malhotra said religious practices cannot be solely tested on the basis of article 14 of the constitution and it's not for the courts to decide on matters of religion in her judgment she said and i quote what constitutes essential religious practice is for the religious community to decide not for the court she added notions of rationality cannot be brought into matters of religion she went on to say that balance needs to be struck between religious beliefs on one hand and cherished principles of non-discrimination and equality laid down by the constitution on the other justice indu malhotra batted for the temple's board and argued that religious practices are protected under the constitution and the shabarimala temple board should be allowed to practice its own customs 
she went on to say that the personal views of the judges were irrelevant and if a person has faith on a certain deity, then the court must respect it. From courts in India to the courts in the US, the first vote by a Senate committee is due over the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the US Supreme Court. It follows dramatic testimonies by Judge Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford, who has accused him of sexual assault. Professor Ford, close to tears, described the alleged 1982 attack in detail, saying it had drastically affected her life. Judge Kavanaugh angrily denied that he had assaulted her or anyone for that matter. President Donald Trump has urged the full Senate to approve his nominee. Republicans currently have a majority of 51-49, but the outcome is far from certain, with a number of senators on both sides remaining undecided. The American Bar Association has called for a delay of both votes to allow the FBI or the Federal Bureau of Investigation to investigate the claims by Professor Ford and two other women. The Supreme Court plays a vital role in U.S. political life. Appointed for life, its nine members have the final say on U.S. lawmaking. Judge Kavanaugh's appointment would tilt the balance in favor of conservatives for years to come. And this is how the drama unfolded at Capitol Hill. Accuser Christine Blasey Ford narrated the whole saga in front of a full House Senate. In response to the charges, Judge Kavanaugh defended himself, saying that he has never done anything to Blasey Ford or anyone else in his life. There was music playing in the bedroom. It was turned up louder by either Brett or Mark once we were in the room. I was pushed onto the bed and Brett got on top of me. He began running his hands over my body and grinding into me. I yelled, hoping that someone downstairs might hear me, and I tried to get away from him, but his weight was heavy. Brett groped me and tried to take off my clothes. He had a hard time because he was very inebriated and because I was wearing a one-piece bathing suit underneath my clothing. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Both Brett and Mark were drunkenly laughing during the attack. They seemed to be having a very good time. Mark seemed ambivalent, at times urging Brett on, and at times telling him to stop. A couple of times I made eye contact with Mark and thought he might try to help me, but he did not. I'm not questioning that Dr. Ford may have been sexually assaulted by some person, in some place, at some time. But I have never done this to her or to anyone. That's not who I am. It is not who I was. I am innocent of this charge. I intend no ill will to Dr. Ford and her family. The other night, Ashley and my daughter Liza said their prayers, and little Liza all of 10 years old, said to Ashley, we should pray for the woman. It's a lot of wisdom from a 10 year old. We mean, we mean no ill will. I am here today not because I want to be. I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me while Brett Kavanaugh and I were in high school. I have described the events publicly before. I summarized them in my letter to Ranking Member Feinstein and again in a letter to Chairman Grassley. 
I understand and appreciate the importance of your hearing from me directly about what happened to me and the impact that it has had on my life and on my family. I categorically and unequivocally de deny the allegation against me by Dr. Ford. I never had any sexual or physical encounter of any kind with Dr. Ford. I never attended a gathering like the one Dr. Ford describes in her allegation. I've never sexually assaulted Dr. Ford or anyone. Again, I am not questioning that Dr. Ford may have been sexually assaulted by some person in some place at some time. But I've never done that to her or to anyone. No, I was scared of the test itself, but was comfortable that I could tell the information and the test would reveal whatever it was going to reveal. I didn't expect it to be as long as it was going to be, so it was a little bit stressful. Listen to the people I know. Listen to the people who have known me my whole life. Listen to the people I've grown up with and worked with and played with and coached with and dated and taught and gone to games with and had beers with. And li listen to the witnesses who allegedly were at this event 36 years ago. Listen to Ms. Kaiser. She does not know me. I was not at the party described by Dr. Ford. <laughs> 